how many single families you got up to before you said, you know what, this is like the time and the effort, whatever. I'm just going to move on to something bigger. I had four. And I think what I realized is even though I had a property manager for the different properties and both in Montana, as well as Ohio, it was still a lot of work. I was getting a lot of calls. These were not like 10 out of 10 neighborhoods or 10 out of 10 houses. These were like four out of 10. You know, these were like, or maybe even three out of 10. So I was getting a lot of rough tenants and just challenging issues, non-payment issues. And so I had this fortuitous conversation with a relative that I hadn't seen in years. year or saw at a family event. You know, person I knew they were in real estate. So I shared my plan to get 30 houses and retire from my great corporate job. And I had a very good job. I was making over 200,000 a year in uh, medical device sales. And so my plan was to maybe not replace that, but replace my living expenses, which is about 60K a year. I live pretty simply. If I could just do that, then I could potentially leave my job and just focus on creative pursuits. And so he said to me, this sounds like a lot of work doing the single family thing. Why don't you do multifamily? And I said, well, I'd love to, but I don't have the money. And he said, well, you can mm -hmm. raise the money. And he taught me about this thing called syndication, which is a, a fancy way of saying you raise money from investors, you pool it together and you buy a big apartment building. I just learned as much as I could, took me down a path, ended up starting a meetup in Los Angeles where I live. Met my first investor there, we raised a little bit of money. And then through a series of events, I found a partner and we raised over the next 18 months after that, I raised about 15 million. So it was just something that the more I learned, the more I got in the space, the more doors opened. And I just kind of went through the next door. And here it is four years later, and I've you know, quit my job and I just pinched myself. I get to do this full time. That's incredible. Because I think that for a lot of people is the biggest hurdle is how do you actually convince individuals to invest with you? Because right? on the one hand, you have to convince them that you have expertise and you have the knowledge and you can do it and you're trustworthy and they can give because generally people want to make sure that they trust and they know the people they give their money to. And it's it's not a trivial sum of money. And so what are some of the tips and tricks that, that you can share with us on how did you make your first sale? How did you get your first deal together? Yeah. So it was interesting. When I first started out, I had calls with friends and family, everybody I thought would be interested. I remember I had 62 calls or in-person meetings with friends and family. And I went through a survey of different questions of things of qualifying them, certain deals. We have to actually get financial information before you can share a deal with someone. And so I went through all that. And of that first deal, absolutely zero of those actually invested. The, none of the people that I knew invested with me in my first deal. The first investor was a guy that you know, I met. There were 60 people at this meetup, the first meeting we had. And he just came up and said, Hey, I do, I do a deal with you, whatever, because he saw that I was leading in the front of the room. I wasn't an expert in the space, but I was a leader in the space. So I always tell people when they're getting started is try to find a place where you can be adding value. So you're doing it with your podcast. You know, I have a podcast as well called the mailbox money show. We talk about passive investing. We do a monthly panel with a bunch of experts. I'm writing a book right now. Any way you can do things to try to really become a leader in the space and you can add value. People start to look to you and say, Hey, I want to work with that person. So that's one thing. I guess the other thing I'll say is, and I've had 1,300 one-on-one -on -one phone calls over the last four years with investors. And one thing that comes up, I realize, is that there are a lot of people out there that have a money problem. And the money problem is not that they don't have money. It's that they have money and they don't know what to do with it, right? So when you have a deal, it's important to realize that you have something to offer people, right? It's not a scarcity mindset of, hey, I'm groveling trying to get this person invest in my deal. Would you please consider? It's really about them and saying like, hey, I like this deal a lot and I really think this might help you. And you have to believe it. You got to believe that, hey, this deal that I'm doing is something that really is going to help this person. So when you approach it, not from a scarcity mindset or kind of a, I don't know, whatever, you just think, no, I, I've got great partners. I mean, I've been doing this four years, but one of my partners who's partners on five or six more, you know, five or six of the recent deals has 28 years of experience and 13,000 units, right? So if you find an experienced partner on the operating side, you can really approach with confidence and say, hey, this is something we've done before. This is what it is. This is what it looks like. And it is a little hurdle just in your mind to be like, yeah, I'm taking somebody else's money. But Robert Kiyosaki, same guy we talked about earlier, he would say it's selfish to just do your own deals with your own money, right? You're not allowing other people a chance to get into a deal and be able to benefit from that as well. That's actually a really good perspective. I like it. 